ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Guru Parulkar. Thank you and welcome back. So I guess uh, this is definitely the highlight of uh, our morning session uh, with John Donovan's uh, keynote talk. So I'm going to take a minute to introduce him. If I can get my slides. OK. So uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be able to introduce John as the keynote speaker. And as I mentioned yesterday, John is uh, at at and senior executive VP. And he's the person who is essentially transforming at and both in terms of infrastructure as well as in terms of processes and organization as well. Uh, I was fortunate enough to spend half a day with him and his team, and you could see uh, the clear mission, clear direction, and what he's up to. And he has bought the whole uh, team uh, buy-in and uh, get at and to uh, take on this particular transformation that he's going to talk about. So he's going to talk about SDN-enabled innovation, uh, how they will impact at and plans to transform its infrastructure. Now, let me tell you a couple of things about John. As I mentioned, he's responsible for all aspects of at and IT and network infrastructure, vision, strategy, planning, implementation, and operation. So that is almost everything, right, that you can think of. Uh, before at and he was at uh, VeriSign, where he was responsible for uh, product sales, marketing, and operations. And before that, uh, Incode, responsible for Incode strategies, direction for wireless network operators, and so on. And what I understand is that he was a boxing champion, he's an avid cyclist, as well as hockey player, and a big fan. And so now that he's on a mission to change the at and infrastructure, I think we should stay out of his way, because you can see what he's up to. So with that, I'll welcome John to come and share his thoughts with us. Thanks, Guru. Morning, everyone. After spending last week in the chaos of Barcelona, I can't tell you how happy I am to be home. Um, and though I, I've lived in Texas for six years now, I can tell you that being back here in Silicon Valley really does feel like home. I was fortunate to live out here for a few years, and my family still enjoys spending as much of our downtime as we can in this area. What I'm going to talk to, uh, about with you today hopefully will help shape your perception not only of AT&T, but the way our industry is going. And a key theme for that will be openness. So let's talk a little about our industry and what AT&T is trying to do. I can sum it up in two words, transformation and innovation. The entire industry is in a period of dramatic change. At AT&T, we believe we can change the way the world works, the way the world communicates. Few would have imagined a decade ago the power we have in our hands today. Even fewer would have predicted the degree to which devices of all shapes and sizes would be connected virtually anywhere and anytime. The number of these devices connected to the network is increasing at an almost exponential pace. The power of each of these devices grows by leaps and bounds. And what each of us is doing with these devices is changing dramatically. We have what once was considered the power of a supercomputer in our hands. And software developers are tapping into their creative energy, pushing the limits every step of the way. And where they come up against a barrier, they don't wait for a solution to be developed for them. They create a solution on their own. In this world, flexibility and simplicity are valued, and speed even more so. These factors are why the cloud has been so impactful over the past decade. It's providing more flexibility and more opportunity, more convenience and more speed. 
At the same time, it requires greater scale and efficiency in handling the sheer number and diversity of endpoints, whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, a TV, a car, or any other device, increasing the need for new resource models inherent in virtual machines. It requires redefining the typical endpoint and the time required to provision services. Our industry's customers, particularly in the enterprises with advanced data centers, already realize this and have seized on its promise. Now, with this in mind, are we as an industry prepared to handle where the trends take us? Let's take a real and honest look at the current state of telecom infrastructure. I'm not going to talk about the enterprise network or data centers, but the backbone itself and the access points that form the foundation of what is the telecom network today. Is it easy to scale? Is it as cost effective as it could be? And is it really adaptable? No. It's not designed to fully take advantage of all of these new opportunities. A time like this requires an urgent call to action. To better manage the changing world of technology, we all will need to pivot, adapt, and transform to drive toward the network of the future. Now, what does that network of the future look like? We at AT&T are calling it the user-defined network cloud. It's a multi-service, multi-tenant platform where equipment is flexible and not specialized for a single function. The design taps into the principles of network function virtualization, or NFV, and software-defined networking, SDN, to perform a broad variety of network functions and services. NFV moves network functions from ASIC hardware-based appliances into software running on virtual machines performing that same network function. This means network functions can be instantiated or updated from almost anywhere more quickly and without having to deploy new hardware, the hardware-based network elements of today. It dynamically reroutes traffic, adds capacity, and introduces new features through programmable, policy-based controllers. SDNs shift the control of the network from hardware to software, removing predefined physical limits. It's an intelligent network that's more flexible, efficient, and aware of specific applications. It's dynamically controlled by intelligent software, moving the primary delivery network into the cloud. It follows an open network concept with APIs that let customers and developers tap into tools and features that only a network operator with broad resources can provide. In short, the user-defined network cloud decouples control of the network from dedicated single-purpose network appliances to software-based controllers that enable the network to become simpler and more scalable. This shift will drive more competition, more innovation, and more efficiency. For customers, this ultimately will help us to move quickly to bring new innovative services and capabilities to market. When we set forth on developing this vision for the user-defined network cloud, we had four key principles in mind. The first, open. We wanted to allow our customers to do more with our network. This means providing unique tools for others to tap into the power of our network and provision what they need when they want it. And APIs are the perfect tool for this. They better enable participation by our vendors, customers, and outside developers. With well-designed APIs, everyone can more efficiently manage, 
manipulate and consume services on demand and in near real time, including our customers and our partners. We also wanted to increase the number and diversity of entities with whom and when we can do business. We will take an evergreen approach to the vendor community. We'll be seeking out small and nimble providers for their innovative capabilities. We'll look to large companies to tap into their economies of scale and medium-sized companies so that we can try new business models. But all will operate among multiple vendors. With this ecosystem, we believe we will maximize the probability of success for AT&T. This allows for non-traditional network players, smaller entrepreneurial companies, the open source community, universities, and others to participate in our new ecosystem in addition to the traditional players. There's some really interesting things going on, particularly in academia, with the potential to radically change the look and feel of tomorrow's network. We see this in the work we're doing with universities, some of which is just, they're just minutes away from where we are here today. We want to tap into that energy and that opportunity. In fact, we also wanted to make the process as open as possible. Rather than do this behind closed doors, relying on just our own opinions, we opened it up to the broader community and developed a white paper that outlines what we want, want to do. That paper is linked from my blog at www.attinnovationspace.com if you're interested in reading it. The second principle is to simplify. The web is named so for a reason. Today's network architecture systems are too complex and difficult to manage. We want the opportunity to weed out that complexity from services and operations as much as possible. We want to take advantage of more nimble service models and a more common infrastructure. However, instead of simply mimicking data clouds, we will build capabilities into our cloud essential for real-time applications that are very sensitive to latency and packet throughput and have inherent resiliency. They also will be highly distributed, capitalizing on our dense fiber and real estate portfolio. The third element is scale. As I mentioned earlier, the number of endpoints and the amount of traffic on the network is increasing almost exponentially. We announced last week that the traffic on our mobile data network has increased more than 50,000% over the last seven years. And the applications being tapped at these endpoints are changing as well. The fourth point is secure. It's certainly not last on our list. To embark on the, this mission, we must protect the integrity of our control plane. Given the rise of attacks, this is top of mind for operators, the business customers, and ultimately our consumers. So to succeed, we must be able to meet these evolving customer requirements. The traffic growth, the diversity of that traffic, the diversity of performance and reliability expectations. We also want to enhance our business efficiency, meaning that we want to do these things with less capital and lower operating costs. And we want to do this quickly while maintaining our high quality of service, which is what AT&T is known for today we will continue to deliver reliability. Sounds easy, right? Well, it's not. But we've been here before. In fact, AT&T has adapted and led through several different inflection points of technology in our history. That's why we're transforming our network from its current state to a future state one in which services are provided in a manner very similar to cloud computing. Our strategy is more than just a change in the network design. It changes how we do business, our collaboration with suppliers, how we manage systems, platforms, software, and most importantly, it changes our very people. 
That's why it's important for us to take advantage of the ongoing cultural change at the company, where we're trying to encourage alternatives, test, fail fast, quickly bring our vision to reality. Right now, today, we're changing everything. How our network is built, how we're buying that network equipment, and the software that will power it. And who we are at AT&T, our operations, and our culture as well. We're looking at purchasing and provisioning common infrastructure using a consumption model, much like the on-demand storage that's common in cloud data centers today. We're tapping into the technologies and open network principles that make that happen. And we're shaking up how we're doing it. We introduced the vendor portion in September. We called it Domain 2.0. It's radically different than our previous next generation network initiatives. It's not just a closed room with a handful of networking companies making decisions. It's an open process that listens to some of the more nimble, innovative ideas and pushes everyone to adapt quickly. The best ideas rise to the top, and the smaller voices are going to get heard. It's not easy. Nothing great ever is. But we're calling on the industry at large to move quickly with us, not stick with the status quo. We've already begun the process. We've reached out to more than 100 different vendors to drive a whole new ecosystem of network innovation. We're changing our procurement process, suppressing the old model immediately, and dedicating the entire capital budget to this new architecture. And some won't share the same interest we do in moving towards a new future. But many have proposed intriguing ideas, particularly in SDN and VFN. And we're jumping on these opportunities right now. The four companies we announced last week are Ericsson, TLF, Affirm Networks, and Metaswitch Networks. Let's put a spotlight on TLF, a smaller company out of Sweden. They've developed innovative network control software that manages the diverse and sometimes proprietary control plane functionality of network devices through an API framework. Think of their software as a translator at the United Nations. It understands the various languages that the devices are speaking, and it's, it itself is open and flexible, and most importantly, it works with existing devices. Let's also talk about Affirm Networks from Massachusetts, Boston area. They've made some amazing advancements in virtualizing the Evolve Packet Core, or what we call in the industry the EPC. And as I mentioned, the two others we've tapped to, to date are Ericsson and Metaswitch networks. Now, another thing we're doing that's a bit different is we're leaving the process open. While we appreciate the benefits of collaboration, we're going to ensure that we stay open to new ideas and maintain an ongoing competitive process. So if a company not initially selected comes along with the right solution at a later time, they'll have a great chance to pursue it with us. And all of this adds up to the need for a cultural shift within our company and how we operate, the skills that we need, and the way that we interact. I'll address more on that in just a minute. Now, these are just a couple of examples of how we're using a fundamentally new and bold approach to build a smart network. Yet it sounds very familiar. Think of it as we're doing with the WAN what the world has done with the data center. It means we intend to provide elastic network services just like the elastic compute and storage services provided in cloud computing today. In fact, we're tapping into some of these same cloud computing technologies and principles. AT&T services will increasingly become cloud-centric workloads. And just as cloud provider customers are able to provision their own services, ours will be able to do the very same thing with the network. Just think, AT&T and our customers will be able to use resources for network capabilities and services on demand with elasticity to scale according to their needs. 
customers will have more control and be able to add new network services on demand and in near real time. This is important because more and more customers are looking for high performing network services and many times with an intense focus on video and large scale machine to machine that are secure and reliable. This program will help us to maintain a leading role in these new areas. The ambitious transition to the user defined network cloud will allow us and our customers to create new products and services quicker than ever before. This approach will help us more quickly address changes in our business and in customer needs. We'll offer a common pool of resources so business customers can use just what they need when they want it. Now there's much more to do before our vision for the user-defined network cloud is realized. We need to pivot from traditional networking to real-time distributed software skills from carrier operations type models to cloud DevOps models. So we're putting out a recruiting call for people skilled in these areas. We have positions open for you. As mentioned earlier, my blog elaborates on this. I encourage everyone interested to visit it at www.attinnovationspace.com. It was good to begin having some productive discussions with some of the interested folks last week. And on my blog, I also elaborate on the journey we're taking, which is a very open process. This open process is important because it signals a dramatic shift in how we are approaching innovation. Part of this includes embracing agile development rather than our current waterfall models of network development and services procurement. We'll need to prototype and not PowerPoint, placing a lot more emphasis on exploration and testing. And along with this comes risk. So the direction requires at AT&T a management willing to try alternatives and unique approaches, to execute them fast, to learn fast, to deliver fast. And that's part of the cultural shift I mentioned. The risk also includes the understanding that the cloud certainly isn't a panacea, even though it has the ability to provide the scale. That said, we're taking the best of the cloud and blending it with our world of network expertise to deliver on our vision for tomorrow's network. In closing, at AT&T, we're thrilled about this, really, really thrilled. Ultimately, through the user-defined network cloud, we'll compose network capabilities and services on demand, and it will be driven with management techniques similar to those seen in the world's cloud data centers. Collectively, we'll all benefit from this transformation. The vision allows for rapid innovation, and we'll have greater access to technologies and innovations from the data centers, and we'll tap into innovation in server hardware, in virtualization, cloud computing, SDN switches and controllers, that independent software development solutions, and open source communities. We'll also take advantage of new business models and faster time to market, delivering greater value for our customers along the way. And just as we've all seen the incredible innovation over the last several years, and we've become more collaborative, we'll see even greater opportunities for third parties to participate in this value chain. This also means increased choice of components, suppliers with diverse sources for hardware and software by forging relationships with vendors and organizations who have not been traditional telecom vendors. AT&T has thrived for more than a century and at times we've pivoted, at times we've led, at times we've innovated, and this really is a time for all of them. This vision is a radical change and it's starting now. Did I happen to mention that we're recruiting people who share the vision? Um, and people here that, that can make it happen. And if I forgot to mention it, I'll say it again. Uh, so thanks for your attention today, and I'm happy to address any questions that you have.
Mr. Mr. Donovan, hi, Jack Carpenter. I'm, I'm, I'm John, my dad's John, not sorry. here. Yeah, yeah. CDT Works and Ramon, we're working on the uh, Agile process for Domain 2.0. Yep. I have a two-part question. If you could just give us a high level, it would uh, do you anticipate an overlay network for SDN on top of our existing worker as a transition? And that's one part. The other part, uh, do you have any strategy, high-level strategy for our existing OSSs, how they're going to evolve to this new model? Yeah, so what, what we're looking for in 2014 is beachhead projects that can move us from an old domain one architecture to a domain two architecture. We're calling, them, we're calling it D1.5. And so what we're trying to do is put controllers on existing platforms. Um, and so where possible, we're trying to, to, to build a set of capabilities that will allow us to go test. But importantly, it's going to allow us to, to extend the, the useful life and increase the utilization of the assets we have in the network. So the primary things that we're looking for in 14 are the delivery of these very fast beachhead projects. We have half a dozen identified, and it's growing rapidly, that allow us to extend that. And then we're going to start to, to do new platforms next year. But we won't do overlay networks. We're going to tag the old stuff, domain one. We're going to toe tag it, uh, the old stuff. And then we're going, to, we're going to do our best to do a rapid pivot to the new environment. Now, the second part of your question on the OSS systems, you know, that's where a fair amount of the, the complexity is. We have a, 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 um, a project overall to retire over 1,000 applications in our OSS environment. So uh, we, we are going to aggressively go onto a target platform that allows for API interfaces into these, uh, these orchestrated networks that will allow us to, to do policy and, and billing and provisioning as a, um, a parallel process as opposed to the inhibiting process that really defines everything that we do. So uh, we have a very aggressive posture there. Thank you very much. Sure. Hey, John, I had two, two quick questions for you. Uh, first, this notion of best of breed vendors and working with you know, wholesale vendors. I'm just curious, how do you manage that ecosystem of partners? Will you look at your larger vendors and maybe have two, three primary vendors to manage the entire ecosystem? Are you open to the idea of working with 15, 20, 25 best of breed vendors in each specific area? Yeah, I don't know that the number will be that big in an area, sure. but, but to, to your point, we're going to have to do some of all the above. The, the project, which is... Uh, complex here is not the project of taking uh, network function control and pull, abstracting it from the metal. The hard part is orchestrating it in a highly distributed network. So that is a massive software project. And if you look at the incremental spend for us, uh, you know where you have benefits on the hardware side, one of the incremental spends is going to be in the area of how that software gets deployed. So th it will be a highly complex uh, uh, multi-participant uh, approach. We're going to have to even write some of it ourselves, but we have a lot of expertise. Our backbone today, we manage over four million routes, and so there's a lot of complexity, and that's larger than you can get from any control plane, so we wrote our own. So we're not, we're not brand new to this game and, and this abstraction. That software project is, is the formidable part of this. We have a lot of benefits along the way, and we are going to rely on certain people to integrate but we're testing some of those folks now. These beachhead projects that I, that I mentioned we're going to do this year has a lot of complex integration across the southbound appliance uh, and east-west to others, uh, uh, other controllers, and then uh, northbound for orchestration and billing. So, so we've we got a lot of work to do. And I just, the second part was exactly to that point. Uh, on the orchestration layer, are you seeing anything innovative coming out of any of the vendors in the space, particularly the larger vendors? Um, it, I would say thus far we've had a lot of very interesting dialogue. We have nothing ready to deploy. So in between those, uh, somewhere along the way. I actually used to, I feel, I feel better behind the podium. I'm an introvert. So <laughs> I might not go over there. Go ahead. Okay, hi. I'm uh, Mitch Wagner. I'm West Coast Bureau Chief for Light Reading. Um, because I'm a journalist, I have no social skills, so I'm going to ask a hostile question. Join a club. Um, and uh, listening to your, uh, hearing about your boxing and hockey experience, please don't hit me. Um, 
W.C. Field said you should never follow an animal act or a child. Um, and I'm kind of wondering if you were making the best choice to follow NTT, because what I heard was they seemed to be talking about the reality of having implemented SDN well along, whereas you're talking about future plans. So am I mishearing your presentation? How far along are yeah. you in actually implementing? Yeah, you are mishearing it. When you look at um, um, simple abstractions and, and where the state of stuff is today, I can give you a long list of all the things we've done. I just mentioned one. We abstracted the entire control plane from our backbone. Our entire common backbone is custom-built software-defined networking that manages 4 million routes and uh, converges sub-50 milliseconds. So we understand that. And there are appliances that can be bought with abstraction layers. We've done that. We've got those deployed in a number of places. But what I'm talking about is a radically reshaping the entire wide area network. And that, in its, in a, in its scale and its scope, puts you into, uh, into problems that aren't going to be solved in traditional vendors. The orchestration uh, of those controllers, when you pull them up, is a very, very complex thing. And so um, I'm happy to follow anybody in, uh, in describing what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis where, where others are today. So I applaud what they're doing. They've always been a, a global leader as it relates to R&D and moving out. And hopefully, they'll be here with us, and we can collaborate and take the benefits of scale across uh, across the organizations. That said, we're moving out. We're moving out in a big way. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, so this I'm question sorry. is a, this question is regarding the service provider part. Now, both both AT&T and NTT, the two you know, service provider behemoths, are adopting SDN, whereas some a speaker some time ago hid behind the data structure, uh, data center when it came to SDN. So my question becomes, as a service provider, why are you going to SDN? What is the single central reason, or maybe a reason or reasons, for which you're moving towards SDN? Because there's no army that can hold back an economic principle whose time has come. How's that work? Yes, sir. Sorry, I um, have you guys queued up and didn't see you over there. Uh, no problem. Um, hi, John. Uh, I'm hi. Ronald Marx from Fraunhofer SIT, um, Secure Information Technology. I really appreciate that you were mentioning security. I haven't heard this term uh, so much in the recent talks. Uh, however, you were talking about integrity of uh, control plane, but what do you tell uh, customers that are uh, afraid of large-scale espionage running your running their services um, on your on your network? Well, I think that there's uh, first of all we have an architectural design for security that is both abstracted and it's cloud-based. We call that platform Astra, and Astra is a is a design that moves all security into the cloud. As an enterprise, we're in the process of moving from you know, uh, uh, firewalled uh, enterprises into highly distributed uh, data piles with, with a uh, very rigorous compliance or requirements around that. And we're moving the security for it in a highly distributed fashion where it's harder to find and then harder to assemble into meaningful assets. And so um, our architecture for security is extremely cloud-based. You know, despite I think a lot of security firms being smallish and very nimble, um, you know, we, we were I, I think the first ones to really push them into a model that gets out of the appliances. Because if there was ever an industry that had more of an appliance mentality than telecommunications, it might have been security, where the next appliance and the next appliance and the next appliance created a, a very healthy leapfrog. But that's an ideal scenario for us to deploy software where you can get the latest features and then start to, to get them to communicate with each other. The most valuable thing out there, as you know, would, would end up being um, signatures that would inform various uh, uh, security platforms to do the things that, that would allow it to get better. So the whole system gets smarter as every component gets smarter. And that's an ideal problem for software as opposed to appliances. Thank you. You're welcome. Will you encourage startups to work with at and and or fund them and or buy from them? Yes, no, yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, we, we, we are working with startups today. Over the last, uh, say, 36 months, we've met over 1,200 of them. We, we catalog them and where they are. We regularly check in with them. We have uh, facilities here in Palo Alto, two of them actually right in, uh, in downtown Palo Alto. We have one in uh, Plano. We have one in Atlanta that's designed around the car. Then we have one over in Israel. And that's all we do. We speed date uh, startups. We don't invest in them because we're not, that's not our, our business. We don't want to be on a cap table for anyone other than selectively where we think they may blow up in a hurry and get distracted from delivering what we need and what they've committed. Uh, that, those are very rare cases. We're not uh, venture investors. There's a lot of folks in this town, including my buddy Jim Getz at Sequoia Capital, um, who do just fine doing that. Um, and then um, we, we are working, and so we are contracting. And I mentioned TLF. I think right now there are about 40 people. Uh, they've been about four or five years in the making. Um, so we're not intimidated at all. Intucell last year was bought by Cisco. We met when they were four people. Um, and we, we took a chance with them. And uh, they had an extraordinary outcome as a startup. But more importantly, they took out you know, 20 basis points of drop calls on a network that was carrying 15 billion calls a day. Uh, John, thanks. When do you think uh, you will see measurable, tangible uh, changes to the AT&T business model as a result of this transformation? Uh, revenues accelerating due to new service creation, lower OPEX, lower CAPEX, and of those three, which one comes first? And when, when, will, when will the investment community see yeah. this in, in your mind? I have to be cautious because I don't want to say anything that be construed as guidance today. It's a technical form. I want to stay within that. So what I will say is that we have said publicly that we think that there will be a downward bias on our CapEx. Um, and, and so when you look at the profile, let me talk about the profile of the technology that we're talking about. 2014 is the year that we do beachhead projects which extend the useful life of existing gear, and, and, and so it starts the process this year in procurement. We're taking engineering limits and redimensioning them. And so we have uh, an impact this year, and then that affords us the opportunity to reinvest in the new platform. So underneath that broad level that I talked about, there are a ton of new things going in and, uh, and where we are uh, extending and getting benefits from the old. And then when we get into 2015, we're going to start to have platforms that were born in the cloud. And I don't mean born in the cloud as, as in the data center. It's, it's born in a highly distributed cloud. Our march down this path will move from us if, conceptually. If, to get you out of the data center mentality, I'll share with you what I, I tell my own team internally. We're going to march to 4,600 data centers. That's how many central offices we have. That will be what allows us to take advantage of our architecture and then the microseconds of compromise that exist between the metal and the application will be overcome by the, the milliseconds we avoid by having an extremely highly distributed, fiber heavy, very, very fast network. So we expect those projects to start to come in in 15. So you can kind of get the sense that this has a, uh, a um, crescendo effect as we move our way through 14 and 15. Next question. Hi, John. Uh, Paul Parker Johnson with ACG Research. Um, um, one of the beauties of Domain 2.0 is its openness. Um, and so you're encouraging, stimulating a lot of development to contribute to progress. So a question is, in sensitive areas like privacy or reliability where, you know, as an operator, you may have some really stringent requirements to hold to. Are you expecting to you know, set firm guidelines for the boundaries that you can live with from the you know, open development community to help guide people along the path of saying, it's great to take your contribution, but this is what we, this is what we have to live with. This is yeah. what we need. Yeah. We, we have, um, there are a couple of forces that weigh in on this. The one is, you know, what we have as legal requirement and, and regulatory requirement. Certainly we will continue to abide by the law and be compliant with regulation. There's also the dimension of the trust that we have with the uh, uh, with our customers and that has to be preserved and that's you know part and parcel of our brand has been that trust. But we have over the last couple of years retooled our, our terms and conditions to be clearer with customers about what we're going to use and how we're going to use it. And we've also 
uh, clarified those boundaries contractually with everybody that works with us to talk about you know, what one does with our data. We've also built some enhanced capability to use synthetic data that will allow one to develop and build capabilities without having to touch the raw. I think we've got world-class capability in that regard. And so where we're marching on the data side of things, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more thrilled. We've invented a, three new pieces of technology that we use internally, one for, not shockingly, our control plane group uh, got involved in trying to build, if you will, the Library of Congress and then the routing system for data objects. It's really no different than packets. And so we've really found a way to lock down our, um, our data but then have abstraction capabilities and then the ability to make it synthetic so we can get a lot of the benefits of development without having to compromise the uh, customer. So uh, we, we are very, very well aware. We'd rather be slow, we'd rather be late, and we'd rather be dumb than, than, um, than compromise any of the things that our brand stands for, nor the law or our regulatory requirement. Thank you. Question over there? Yes. Uh, Thanks, you're the first one over in that microphone. That's the. Shy side of the room. Hi, John. Uh, I heard you mention a lot about a wide area network. I'm just wondering, uh, can you comment on the wireless uh, cellular network? When are you moving that into SDN? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, the, right now, the, uh, the access part of our network and the core backbone are the two areas that have the highest requirements and the, the least generated incremental benefit. So as you sequence these projects, the ones up front, the front of the line, will be those that require fewer data, data centers and are more latency tolerant, things like policy and authentication and all those uh, core-related activities, like the, the Evolve Packet Core is a, the, the mobile core. So we're converging our core. We're converging wireless and wireline in our um, what we're calling our, our universal services platform, but it's IMS. Those are the early roadmap items. And then we work our way into the, uh, the access portion of the network. We're very optimistic. We really like what we see in the wireless network. But in the beginning, those will look more like RNC pooling. So I could stand up here and pound my chest and say, we're, we're already doing that. But uh, when we talk about really virtualizing it, we're gonna march down that path over the next uh, couple of years. We're gonna start with pooling. And the problem gets very complex when you start to get multi-technology. So we have, you know, you'll have 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi. We have Spectrum at 700, 850, you know, 1900, AWS, WCS. And then we have to load that stuff up and it was very, very fast. So the, the benefits aren't as great there or in the backbone, the backbone because most of the trade-offs of, of mileage uh, switching versus routing, we've already, I think, optimized efficiently. So, thanks. So, John, could I insert a couple of questions before we run out of time? No. You have already broken the record in terms of number of questions that you generated. So, uh, you know, so I don't want to lose my opportunity either. Okay, we'll put you at the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll just take the two that are standing. They've already made the effort, okay? Is that right? I'll, I'll answer them fast. Okay, I, I've been standing longer, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you, John. That's okay, go ahead. You're running the show. No, 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 go ahead, please. Thanks, John. Nap Chander <clears throat> with IDC. Um, obviously, a, you know, a signature moment in telecom with Domain 2.0. Uh, I want to take a look and ask you about looking internally, cultural change, you know, how disruptive internally in terms of people will SDN and virtualization and, and user-defined impact AT&T. So take autonomics and new types of technologies. What's AT&T going to do and to send messages internally saying we're going to be reducing staff. Your job is going away. You are defining a role that may not exist. So how are those transformations uh, being addressed? Not just the technical part, but the people process and implementation of all of this. The, the, the corporate view is it's our responsibility as executives to let people know where we're going. The business owes the individuals the tools to go from here to there, and then the individual has the responsibility to step up and build a career path. You've, you've seen that we've done um, things like the MOOC that we did with Georgia Tech, first of its kind computer science degree. The, we have roughly 50% of the, the, the first class that goes in there. 
Um, and so it's not lost on us that we need a mid-career pivot. And so we've been working closely with Sebastian over at Udacity. We've looked at certifications in lieu of degrees where you can go with a T-cert, AT&T, a U-cert with, with um, uh, Udacity. And then we have a bunch of people that are taking the Georgia Tech computer science course to learn the latest coding techniques um, outside of the traditional degree program, but taking the courses just to get a certification. So we're well aware of it. It's a big, big emphasis for us. The objective is to leave no person behind who would like to make this journey and has the individual commitment and fortitude to go get it done. Okay, last question out there, Guru. Okay. Hi. So um, SDN certainly has a great opportunity to uh, be used to optimize different classes of traffic, um, certainly improve the overall efficiency of the network. Can you comment on how that would impact uh, net neutrality? Well, I, th I don't think it's going to uh, change the the that one iota. I mean, if you look today, you have um, a lot of a lot of the things that one does in software controls. You do in the QoS systems that are built into the element management systems, and so most of that scheduling occurs right now. It, it's so it's all we're doing is we're moving the scheduling to a static people-driven process to a dynamic and more automated system. So I don't see that that will, that the architectural shift will change the, the debate one way or the other. Okay, Guru. Yeah, so I have two questions. So one is, you know, on one hand, it is great to hear that you're going to work with the small companies, startups, and all of that. So what are you really changing in terms of your processes so that this qualification or procurement can really change? Because you know, uh, typically, people say it takes 18 months for a service provider or AT&T to be able to qualify the equipment, test it, all of that before they will deploy it. So uh, specifically, what are you trying to change to make that faster? Well, I think that, that there are a number of things we're doing today. The first is to move the proof point from a, um, a technology discussion into a prototyping exercise. So a compelling vision should produce a project, not a discussion. And we've, we've got dozens of projects underway right now. Um, I mentioned a couple of them. I mentioned a couple of smaller companies. We're building. We're building alongside them. So our objective is to take two-thirds of the cycle time out. So we, we are really um, uh, trying to build processes that operate at the pace that this technology does. OK. And then the second question I was going to ask you, this 5.9 availability has been a big thing in the carrier business. And that has kind of meant it harder for some of the uh, early products to get into the service provider or carrier networks. Do you have an idea how that is going to change? Because I suppose you still want that 5.9 availability. Yeah, so you know, what is the trade-off? What, what are you going to do about it? Well, do you, do you know what 5.9 translates to in the number of minutes of a downtime? Yeah, like five minutes in a year or something, right? Close enough. Yeah. But, but so the difference between what sometimes people want to bring in of nine fives versus five nines, <laughs> there's a long journey in the middle there. And, um, and we've got to get out of either. And so there's a lot of folks come in and say, oh my goodness, look what I have. And then they don't pass basic muster when you talk about scalability. So if the principles are right, then you're going to get into the code strings and you'll try to manage through that. But we don't want to march from nine fives to five nines, because that takes a very long time and the customers get bloodied along the way. So, Knowing that, we know the areas of our network where we're going to be willing to take risk, and the, the, we know that cycle time trades off against some of those nines, and we've got to be prudent about how we manage it because we have a lot of mission-critical services that we operate, but we do understand that trade off and know that we need to make it, and we're prepared to do that. That's where the courage and the risk comes in. Okay, with thank that, you, I think we so will much. close. It's a terrific uh, talk. I uh, really appreciate it.